In this section, we are going to look at comparing two population proportions. I do want to point out that there are more than four sections in Chapter 9, just as there were in Chapter 8, um, but we are not going to look at comparing um, standard deviations and variances. In this section, we're going to look at two population proportions. The conditions are that we have random samples that are independent. The conditions for a binomial distribution are met, which means the success fail are the only two outcomes. And the sample sizes are large enough to ensure that each sample has at least 10 successes and 10 failures. So again, pretty straightforward, just as we had when we had one proportion. Our point estimate is just going to be the difference in our observed proportions for each sample. The margin of error is essentially the margin, excuse me, the standard deviation of each sample, which again, p hat q hat divided by n, and then p hat q hat divided by n of the next sample, adding them together and dividing by the square, or and taking the square root. That's going to give us the standard deviation. And then of course, we're back to the Z model because we're dealing with proportions instead. And then to find the confidence interval, we subtract E and add E to the point estimate. We're going to take a look at two questions together. And again, in this section, I've chosen not to do either example by hand. So we're just going to go straight to Excel. And I'm going to start just by showing you how I set up Excel. So first thing is, Typically, you're going to be given the number favorable out of the total number for the first sample and for the second sample, and then the confidence interval. So that's how I'm going to set mine up for all of my inputs. Now let's talk about the outputs. We need p hat, which of course is just the number favorable divided by the total number. And then q hat is just 1 minus p hat, which your book, I think, just calls it 1 minus p hat. So same thing. And then I'm going to do the same thing for sample B. So B number favorable over total number, and then one minus B9. That's going to give me information that I need for my margin of error. The um, point estimate is just going to be the first P hat minus the second P hat. So again, looking at that slide where we said the point estimate is P hat one minus P hat two. The critical value is again using norm S inverse. Um, and we've talked about how to do this so often, I feel like I don't even need to say it anymore, but if it's a 90% interval, you've got the 90 plus half of alpha to make it that 95 and so on. And then notice here on this one, I, whoops, I did not want to do that. Don't wanna mess anything up. Um, notice here on this one, I did not give you a space for the standard error. And I did that on purpose because students often get a little bit frustrated and they say, oh, well, you didn't give me the same spaces on the project that you did on, you know, on the, the video that you did. And that's okay, because as long as you understand the functions, you can set up Excel to work the way you want it. So if you'll recall, the margin of error is found by taking the critical value, which is B13, and then we're going to take it times the standard error. And the standard error is that very long equation that said take the square root, so notice square root, of p hat q hat divided by n for each standard deviation. So b7, b8 divided by b2 would be, for sample a, p hat q hat divided by total number and then for sample B, B9, B10 divided by B4. So if I did have a space for standard error, it would have just been all of this stuff. But notice I'm able to still find E without having a space for standard error. It just does it all in one big uh, formula. And then of course the lower limit, B12 minus B14, and then B12 plus B14. And then I've got this extra thing over here, and this is just a way to help me check conditions. And remember, each of these needs to be at least 10, so N1P1, N1Q1, N2P2, N2Q2. So I'm just multiplying each of those respective values to make sure that those are 10. 
So really, now that I have my spreadsheet set up, all I have to do is make sure I enter my values correctly. So in this particular question, we're looking at students in school A that are in a lower economic district, socioeconomic district, um, then, and who carry cell phones, and then the percentage of students who carry cell phones in school B, which is an upper socioeconomic district. So A, and again, this is already set up A, B, which is great. A, 45 students carry cell phone. Now, the mistake a lot of students make then is to choose 31 for cell 2. Now, that's not going to work because remember cell 2, B2, is the total number. So the total number is not 31. The total number is 40, 45 plus 31, which again, you can add in your head or you can you know, have Excel calculate for you. And then for school B, 53 carry a cell phone out of a total number of 53 plus 25. And I'm trying to find a 90% interval. Now Excel has done all of the work for me and has found that each of these is at least 10. My P hat, B1 minus B2, and then one minus B7, and then B3 minus B4, and one minus B9. So those are my P hats and Q hats. I have a point estimate that's negative and then a margin of error. Notice this is now my confidence interval. So writing it mathematically, I would write it as negative 0.21 to 0.04. What does the interval mean? Remember there's two parts. So the first part would say I'm 90% confident that the percentage of students who carry a cell phone in school A is between negative 21 or 21% less to 4% more than students who carry a cell phone in school B. The second part of that conclusion would have to do with whether or not zero falls in the interval. Because zero falls between those two values, there is no evidence that students in school A or school B carry cell phones at a different rate. One last question. You can try it on your own first if you'd like, or you can just work through it with me. We are looking at determining if instructional technology improves student scores. So we have looking at students who use instructional technology and whether or not they pass the class. So we are looking for a 95% confidence interval for the true difference between the proportions. So for the first um, sample, 45 out of 50. So in this case, we are given the 50, so I don't have to take 45 plus 50. It's 45 out of 50. We're in classes that use the instructional technology and pass the class. And 38 out of 51 is my second sample who were in classes that did not use the instructional technology, which is just using technology in an instructional way to help you understand materials. Um, construct a 95% confidence interval, so 0 0.95. Again, all of the work is done for me, but I still have to be the one to understand what I just found. So my um, confidence interval is that I am 95% confident that students who used instructional technology passed between uh, point, or sorry, 1% more and 30% more than students who did not use the instructional technology. And again, because zero is not in the interval, we can say that there is evidence that using instructional technology helps students pass at a higher rate than those who don't. Awesome job making it this far. So coming up next, we are going to go into chapter 10. And chapter 10 and 11 is all about hypothesis testing. So up to this point, we have taken a look at intervals at which we can expect um, means or proportions or differences in means or proportions to fall in. Now we want to take a look at testing a specific hypothesis. So looking at our sample, versus something that we would expect to happen. So stay tuned.